you can tell from the way that they walked in that they're really not going to follow my lead here at all, right? <laughs> it's, uh, so I, I, got, I got a panel that's going to be autonomous and independent, which is great. So I'm Michael Casey. I am the uh, chief content officer at Coindesk, which is the leading media platform for the cryptocurrency, digital assets, and blockchain space. Uh, and I'm thrilled to have a tremendous panel with us today to talk through what truly is, I think, you know, I've been covering this space for, you know, eight years as a journalist. And I feel like we're at this moment right now where things are getting really quite interesting. Just the, the SALT conference itself speak, speaks to that in terms of the crypto presence here. But before, you don't want to hear from me, you want to hear from these guys. So quick introductions. We have Nathan McCauley, who's the CEO of, of Anchorage. Dan Moorhead, the CEO and founder of Pantera Capital. Zach Prince from BlockFi. Catherine Molnar, who's the CIO of Fairfax County Police Officers Retirement Fund, and Michael Shaloff from Fireblocks. Uh, so, look, Dan, I thought I'd throw it to you first, if you don't mind, just to give people a sense of the journey. You, something of a visionary, started investing, you know, really as a VC, back in 2013 in this space. You've seen a lot change over the time. What are the, what are the big lessons that you take away from this for, for anybody here who's looking to, to get their feet wet? Yeah, thanks. I think we're still in the early innings of the multi-decade transformation that's going to have a huge impact on literally billions of people. And this conference is a great example of how much the interest has grown in this space. Uh, the community used to be a really tiny little thing. And I was thinking back when you first asked about that, when I first was pitching endowments and other institutional investors on, on Bitcoin, the space had one asset manager with one fund with one asset. That doesn't really sell very well. People, you know, uh, certainly didn't want to take that very um, focused risk. And I remember going into meetings with big endowments. You'd say, hey, I'm willing to come out to your college and, you know, talk about what Bitcoin is in 2013. And you'd get the CIO and like 20 people in a room and you'd have this great conversation for an hour. And then you kind of get to the end of it and nothing happens. And the, you, uh, it's obvious you're not going to get uh, any interest or any subscription from the endowment. So then you say goodbye and they're walking out to the elevator and everybody's whispering, what's the minimum? Because <laughs> they all want to invest personally. And, you know, now it's flipped. You know, the institutional investors are calling us and, you know, it's much more engaged. So I love seeing that this journey we're on, which I think still has a couple more decades to go, is really taking off. So on that note, Catherine, you, you, you're one of those institutions that earlier than most, I would say, from so certainly from the pension fund world, decided that this was something that you were going to get into. Uh, how did, you know, first of all, how did you convince your trustees and others to dive into this crazy space? Um, sure. Thank you. And it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, so a colleague and I, we manage two different systems, but we work closely together. We um, started looking closely at the Bitcoin, but really more blockchain technology space in the spring of 2018. And we identified a manager that we were really interested in investing with. And to be very clear, um, it's venture capital. So we were not trying to invest in Bitcoin. We were not even trying to more broadly invest in cryptocurrency only, rather the infrastructure that underlies all of the cryptocurrencies and all the protocols. So really blockchain technology itself. So we've made four investments now. Um, going back to how the approval process, uh, we went on site to see the manager in the summer of 2018, so a little more than three years ago. And of course, staff went on site as we always would do. But in addition to that, we took a number of trustees from the different systems with us because we wanted them to really hear the message directly from the manager. So a group of probably eight to 10 people that represented Fairfax County between staff and trustees went um, and stayed there for about four hours. And so the following month in September of 2018, um, I presented it to my board and they approved it. Um, but I would tell you that it wasn't without a lot of discussion and even once it was approved, there were definitely um, employee uh, groups within the county that were um, pretty upset about it, actually. And there were concerns such as, you know, is this a way to, to uh, launder money? And of course, representing a police officer's retirement system, that's something that's pretty important to them. Um, and, and just uh, in general, there, you know, there, was, there was some pushback, but I think ultimately we tried to impress upon them that we thought that this was a really uh, potentially high growth area. Um, it's part of a broader innovation allocation. 
Um, we consider it venture capital, even though there is a certain portion that's actually liquid, up to 20 to 30% can be liquid cryptocurrency, but nevertheless, we consider it to be venture capital. It's sized as venture capital, so starting out initially, and for my system, is about a 50 basis point allocation. We re-upped once to 1%, so doubling it, and then we've since made two additional investments, so we're now at four investments so far, all of them so far in venture capital, I would tell you. Um, uh, those that that two percent target is now worth over seven percent in our portfolio. It's done that well, um, and we are potentially or planning to recommend um, a new manager next month that will be truly classic liquid cryptocurrency, like a typical like a proper long short hedge fund um, evergreen. So, so those those data is now a little bit more comfortable with the the steps you took then. Were they more comfortable now? The, the, yeah, the, the trustees, the, the, the people who had their doubts earlier on, probably happy to see those sorts of returns, I imagine. Yeah, so I think that definitely the second and third and fourth time around were certainly a lot easier than the initial, um, the initial approval, naturally. But um, the performance has been very good. And then I just think in general, the service providers in this, this realm of, of, of asset management um, are better known. There, there are some very well-known institutions um, that are that are now willing to custody digital assets. That wasn't the case three years ago when we made our initial investments. So even just some of the community around digital assets, I would tell you, has become more institutional or certainly better known to to investors. And so I think that's also gone a long way. Yeah, I mean, we were talking in the green room before about, you know, say, the emergence of Ellen in the custody space and Fidelity. These are sort of common names and how that has helped people to, I suppose, just feel more comfortable with it. But Five blocks might have a different uh, uh, take on this and on, on, on what really the, the, the quality of custody is. So you, first of all, if you don't mind, Michael, explain your service. You're a custody provider, but it's, you've got an interesting uh, structure there where you service both institutions and you know, you've got two custody models, yeah. Yeah, so, so I think that you know, from where we stand and what we do, we basically provide a, a technology infrastructure that is custodial, custodial for uh, the different players in this space. Uh, which is relying on a technology that's called multi-party computation that I'll explain in a second. But the idea is that uh, the way that we provide our technology service, if it's basically directed to funds uh, or you know, for, for companies that are uh, consuming it directly, it's, almost, uh, it's basically self-custody, right? So they're basically able to manage the wallets. But you know, although people uh, have this kind of... Uh, Notion when when you when you say when you tell people self custody they think that someone has a disk on key uh, in their uh, you know back pocket and they're basically running with a million dollars of uh, crypto in a in a on a disk on key. Um, it's actually the complete opposite, right? Basically, there are very sophisticated systems that are able to protect the wallet and are able to protect the 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 keys that uh, secure uh, the uh, the wallets in, in a way that uh, creates all those layers around. Um, security, governance, approval processes, compliance, and first of all, you know, people can basically access it directly, right? So we, you have hedge funds that can basically consume it, and then, in a sense, it's basically like self custody, right? But it is secure. On the other side, uh, we do power some of the biggest custodians. So the, you know, earlier this year, it was made public that uh, Bank of New York Mellon invested in our company, and we are working with Bank of New York Mellon to basically establish their custody. Uh, technology and offering, and you know, and we're working with quite a few of the other tier one one banks, right? So when this technology is basically consumed by a licensed institution, then you're basically getting the sort of the traditional custodial infrastructure through which people can access. But again, highly secure uh, with all the you know right protocols and and uh, and and then like you know also the operational procedures. And the balance sheet that I think a lot of the people, the balance sheet and the brand that a lot of the people on, in the traditional financial uh, side uh, on Wall Street really looking for to partner. And I think that the, the most interesting and most fascinating thing about maybe people like uh, Bonnie and uh, Bank of New York Mellon and, and Fidelity, right, is that they already have agreements in place with pretty much most of the, um, you know, uh, hedge funds or asset managers. Uh, on Wall Street, and they can basically service them under the same agreement. Um, you know, one of the aspects of that question around custody and the two models you're talking about, uh, I think inevitably leads us to uh, questions around regulation, right? There's, there's this sort of uh, inherently different regulatory structure when there is a custodian uh, of the client's assets. So, so Nathan, I thought I'd just throw to you just to give us some picture. You, you, Anchorage has taken a 
very distinct path as to how you know you are going to get yourself regulated. You, you know, you've opted to be a bank. Um, maybe talk a little bit about that and you know what the logic behind that is and, and how you see the regulatory framework kind of evolving right now. Sure, I think on our side, our uh, animating force at Anchorage continues to be service of our clients. And so when clients look at uh, looking to invest in crypto assets, looking to invest in uh, blockchain-based technologies, uh, certainly they need, they need very secure custody, they need flexible custody so they can do whatever they want with their assets. Uh, but they also need that to be inside a, a regulated entity in a regulated environment. Uh, and so we kind of took it upon ourselves to do uh, what we think of as some of the some of the trailblazing in that space. Uh, we actually went to the the federal regulators, the OCC, uh, and got a bank charter. And so what we did was we took our uh, state chartered trust company, converted it into a national bank. Uh, and so when you're holding your Bitcoin or your Ethereum or any of your other long tail of assets that you might have, whether it's a uh, uh, some of our clients have bought NFTs and they're holding those in, in our bank or um, Ethereum other assets and they're, say, staking their assets. You can do all of that within a, a chartered bank. Uh, so this is ex extremely meaningful any, for any kind of institutional investor. Uh, their primary regulator is the SEC, and so we want to make sure that we can help our clients meet any of their obligations uh, to the SEC. Uh, and increasingly, one of those sets of clients that wants to do that is um, fintechs and banks. Others who are kind of looking to roll out services in this area uh, really like the idea of working with a, a technology provider uh, that is also regulated at the same level as them. Uh, there's a lot of uh, kind of joint shared responsibility that you can do uh, if you have kind of blockchain focused compliance people. Uh, and as we as we look at banks uh, coming in, especially looking at all of the compliance and regulatory obligations that they might have as a bank. Uh, looking at how to make sure that they properly think about uh, capital adequacy and balance sheet versus non-balance sheet treatment uh, for the assets. Uh, there's just a really irreducible complexity when it comes to uh, coming into the space. And so we look at packaging kind of all of that together, uh, both the technology, the technology to do the custody and kind of a, a partner on the, on the regulatory and compliance side uh, to really uh, bring things to market sooner. Whole reason we want to do this is that we think that this is the uh, the probably the most exciting asset class that has uh, come up, and certainly the most exciting asset class that will come up in our lifetimes. Uh, and what we want to do is make sure it's available to everybody. And the the best way to make it available to everybody is that uh, every bank becomes a crypto bank, uh, and really every business becomes a crypto bank. In the same way, that there's there's no there's no notion at this point of an internet business. Everybody is an internet business. Uh, we we assume that everybody will become a crypto business, and we want to be an enabling force for that movement. You say so, uh, everybody becomes a crypto bank or a crypto business because a bank is a, a very specific uh, uh, you know, regulatory status, right? Uh, or is it that, that, that we are moving to a world where these lines get blurred somewhat? Uh, the way I think the way we think about it is that uh, increasingly, say over the next several decades, it is is very likely that most banks will decide that they want to hold Bitcoin decide that they want to hold uh, this, this asset class for their clients. Um, and a lot of that is going to be because of their retail clients wanting to do it, but also their institutional clients doing it. So uh, especially when you look at the diversity of kinds of assets that you can look at, sure, you've got Bitcoin and Ethereum, which are primarily right there as investment assets. And you start to look at stable coins. Stable coins might well be the underpinning of the uh, the next generation of payments uh, for America and for the, the, the world globally. Uh, if you're going to be a bank that builds on um, USDC or other stable coins, uh, you're going to want a partner that you can work with. Uh, in our case, uh, just to take an example of that, uh, Visa is working with us in order to settle USDC payments uh, entirely within the, within the Visa network. Uh, so you can settle a, a payment entirely in USDC, uh, using the Anchorage infrastructure that is that is built up there, uh, and so we we think as as there is a ongoing proliferation of digital digital assets, a lot of these use cases will start to come together. So yes, it will be it will be banks that come, mm. in, uh, but then it will be all of the other uh, all of the other businesses will be processing and looking at uh, maybe accepting payments in stable coins, holding uh, holding assets, and really kind of building up their building up their infrastructure on top of this blockchain ecosystem. Which brings me to you, Zach. Uh, you know the, uh, the 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 most one of the most interesting and dynamic areas 
of digital assets in the past year has been the lending business and, and been built on top of that. And BlockFi is truly a trailblazer in that. Uh, but you've run into some challenges lately on the regulatory front. Speaking of that, uh, I know there's probably limits to what you can answer here, but like, how is this all going to play out? Uh, you know, what's 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 your expectation? You've had a number of cease and desist uh, letters from uh, state regulators, and of course, we had the case last week where uh, Coinbase revealed that they had a Wells letter from the SEC about their own lending program. Uh, it, it looks to some as if there's a big bucket of cold water being thrown on this business. Is, is that the case, or is is there a, a more positive outlook from all of this? Yeah, so I, I certainly think there's a positive angle. So first off, in case anyone's not familiar with BlockFi, we're a financial services provider to both retail and institutional market participants in the space. So on the retail side of our platform, we're most well known for being one of the first companies that enabled folks to earn interest on their cryptocurrency and also stablecoin holdings at really attractive rates. Recently, we also launched the world's first Bitcoin rewards credit card where you earn Bitcoin instead of airline miles or regular cash back. And then on the institutional side of our platform, we provide uh, bespoke financing and trade execution for both the spot and derivatives market to institutional clients that include hedge funds, asset managers, market making firms, proprietary trading firms, and crypto corporates. Um, prior to starting BlockFi, I was in the online lending industry. And like a lot of uh, other fintech sectors, I think the cryptocurrency and specifically the cryptocurrency lending sector is starting to go through a regulatory come to Jesus moment in time. Uh, and, and these things happen. It happened in online lending. It happened in payments. If you read books about PayPal and, you know, so what's happened so far for BlockFi is New Jersey sent us a uh, order requiring us to stop accepting new clients to earn interest on our platform. This happened back in July. The order initially had a 48 hour effective date uh, or a 48 hour effective window of time. That's now been pushed back multiple times, but there have been four other states who have jumped into the fray and, and sent information requests or, or public hearing notifications to BlockFi. And ultimately, I think, and the Coinbase news points to this, uh, there needs to be clarity at the national level. So, so we're not gonna decide what box crypto lending belongs in based on what New Jersey does or what Texas does or, or what any one other state does, it's going to come down to federal regulators like the SEC uh, or the OCC um, uh, creating a path for this type of activity to happen, which I believe is fundamentally, fundamentally activity that's good for consumers, it's good for the cryptocurrency market, uh, and it's activity that we want America to lead on. So uh, from the early days of BlockFi, we've... Um, blaze trails in terms of regulation. Going back to 2017, we were the first company in a lot of states to get licensed to make loans to people secured by their Bitcoin as collateral. Um, and I think that uh, we're having very productive conversations now. I can't talk too much about who we're having those conversations with and what, what that may result in. But um, I think that uh, ultimately we'll get this right. There's going to be a period of time where things are getting sorted out for BlockFi and others in the industry. But I think that uh, America will land on the right side uh, of this, and there'll be clarity provided, which will just uh, further fuel growth uh, of the industry. So I want to, you know, in a moment, drill down into all of the interesting things that can be done with these new lending protocols and the like, and what that means for institutions like, you know, the Fairfax County uh, Police Officers Fund. But just running with the regulatory story for a little bit, because it has become, I think, quite interesting of late. Certainly, it feels more intense. In both directions, you feel as if there are there is a growing awareness of the opportunity here, and and on, on Capitol Hill, a bipartisan interest amongst certain uh, lawmakers in uh, some sort of very constructive, innovative approaches to to regulation, but also a, you know, a somewhat more vociferous voice uh, of the antagonists as well. So, first of all, Dan, I was just thinking because you've been watching this uh, again for eight years now, what's your read on on where it's, go it's going? Is this just sort of a natural part of the the evolution because you say there's still a number of decades to go until we end up wherever this is supposed to be what's your what's your read on the current regulatory outlook for the space well, i think it's 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 important to to focus on the fact that most of the regulatory bodies in most countries have ruled very favorably about blockchain and most of them ruled you know 8 years ago um the irs ruled that cryptocurrencies properties you get long term capital gains tax treatment occ 
CFTC has always been very progressive. You know, so most of the regulatory bodies are rule. There's a few that are still trying to figure it out. It's, uh, you know, it's going to take a, a little bit of time, but most of the bodies have ruled. And that's globally, too. Most countries, their regulatory bodies are at least neutral. There's a few countries like Luxembourg that are very positive on crypto. Um, so, and it, it's a global phenomenon. Uh, China has a blockchain. And so, you know, the blockchain toothpaste is out of the tube and the U.S. has to have a policy and catch up. And the Federal Reserve is building a blockchain. But it is one of those things that, like, whether you love it or hate it, blockchain is here. And so regulators mm -hmm. have to uh, get on it. You know, Nathan, Zach was talking about this kind of like this uh, almost like pivotal moment, like somebody has some sort of reconciliation or re needs to happen perhaps at that national level. And there are folks who are saying it's time for a, a legislative uh, response, that it's just, you know, the SEC might be sort of dealing with some outdated laws at this stage. Um, you know, and I think you've mentioned to us in one of our conversations that, that there's this international component to this, and Dan was alluding to it, that, you know, uh, U.S. leadership in many respects is is at stake. Uh, talk us through that, if you don't mind. What do you, how do you see that playing out? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think to to Dan's point earlier, we are in very very early innings of what may be decades or centuries long movements uh, that'll be. I think we all on stage probably feel that this is going to be extremely important for uh, America and kind of America's. Uh, place in the global financial system, global financial capital markets, um, really dominance in a lot of ways. And so getting a getting a real handle on the way we want to set that up, uh, strategically the way that uh, the, the United States financial system uh, will kind of continue to have uh, increased relevance uh, in this in this new ecosystem. Uh, all of these are kind of the, the core policy questions that need to get answered. Uh, but we're we're incredibly orderly on that. I mean, we have the uh, we are the the first crypto bank uh, to kind of be live, be taking uh, clients clients' assets on and, and and processing that. And so there's there's just one so far. Uh, there are a, a few uh, folks that are doing lending programs like uh, like Zach's. Uh, so there's just a there's just a lot of work to do, and we're we're very early on with this. Uh, likely the 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 rise of the kind of the the tech and internet ecosystem is is helpful to kind of think about this. It is is very good from a from a national security sense, uh, from a from a global policy sense, uh, that some of the biggest internet companies are based here in America, and I I, I think that we would uh, do well to make sure that the the big crypto companies are based here, and any any nation on earth should probably want that, uh, and that is the that is kind of the core policy question on how do we do that, how do we do that well. Uh, maintaining the safety and soundness of the system, uh, but how do we how do we make sure that the the value accrual that comes from uh, being such a big player in the global financial markets uh, perpetuates? And I think that a lot of that is uh, around keeping the keeping the innovation here, making sure that uh, lots of that kind of innovation can happen, uh, but then also providing the the clarity that's needed and uh, likely clarity at the federal le level will be the the most helpful and the highest impact. Yeah, if I could, if I could expand on that a little bit. So, you know, one of the things um, that I think is often a, a misnomer from folks who are learning about crypto uh, for the first time, and um, they come in with it with an expectation that inherently the cryptocurrency in industry is anti-dollar, or you know, Bitcoin is meant to uh, disrupt the dollar and take over as the global reserve uh, currency. Um, and, and I actually think that. Uh, if you look at what's happening in the industry, if you look at the growth of stable coins, if you look at adoption on platforms like BlockFi and others of not just folks in the U.S., but companies and individuals outside the U.S. borrowing in dollars, which is a massive market in the traditional financial system. It's over a $12 trillion market of dollar-denominated debt that's held by ex-U.S. companies and, and governments, which has typically had very restricted access uh, in terms of smaller companies and individuals, but the cryptocurrency industry and the platforms uh, like the ones represented on this stage enables that to become much more available on a global scale. Um, and so I think that uh, as education happens, folks will learn that the cryptocurrency industry and the technology that supports it is actually very positive for the interest of America and the interest of the dollar. Um, and, and that's a, a storyline that I think will 
continue to come out as data is shared and folks educate themselves on uh, what's happening uh, in the industry. You know, on, on that note, Michael, you know, when Dan first started investing in this space, as he said, there was just one asset, right? That was all you really focused on. Um, and, and now there's this proliferation uh, of, of so many different, not just assets, but actually investing strategies, you know, like there's, there's lending strategies and a whole host of yield farming games and so forth. What are you seeing as a, as a provider to this industry about where the activity is going right now? I mean, we, we actually see that um, there is a tremendous momentum around DeFi, right? The centralized finance. And, you know, for people here that are not familiar with what, what DeFi is, so DeFi is essentially um, sort of those autonomous uh, financial applications that are able to run on the, on the blockchain and, you know, and facilitate whether it's trading or lending or anything that you basically familiar from the traditional financial space. They're able to perform that by running uh, on top of the blockchain in, in you know, a way with, where there is no sort of single counterparty that you're taking risk uh, into and it's all programmatic. So, you know, clearly in the last uh, 18 months, we've seen an explosion around the uh, utilization of, uh, of uh, DeFi protocols. And it's actually like almost everything in crypto, it's actually started from retail, right? It was a retail phenomenon. You had retail investors that were basically working with those DeFi protocols using something that's called MetaMask. It's like a, a really cute, you know, plugin for Chrome with a Fox that you can uh, use. And suddenly, I, I would say, you know, a bit over a year ago, we started to see this massive influx of, uh, of, of hedge funds and market makers and essentially anyone who was interested in this technology coming in. Uh, we were sort of a bit lucky because we've made some technology investments uh, to support it ahead of time. And about you know nine months, I would say, we created institutional capabilities, right? To do it in a secure way with the policies and, and workflows and all that. And nowadays we have say about uh, 25 to 30% of our clients are basically using DeFi to, um, as part of their strategies. You know, everything from yield farming, which is basically creating some, you know, financial incentives. But we've seen a, we are seeing a real, you know, a real world use cases around using DeFi. So I'll just give an interesting example of how this relates to stable coins, right? So one of the, um, you know, stable coin is basically a, a, a token that uh, is, it represents a, a real FX currency, right? One to one. Like, um, and there are protocols like Uniswap and, and Curve that essentially allow you to do this exchange, right, between one stable coin to another stable coin, right? So you can do it between, you know, one form of US dollar, such as uh, USDC to USDT, which is the stable coin that is actually popular in Asia, or you can do it between, for example, you know, USDC to a, Jap to a tokenized Japanese yen. And the efficiency of those markets, right, uh, that you see on DeFi protocol are in, in, in some cases are actually better in, from a slippage standpoint than the FX rate that you would get through, through the bank. So um, you're actually starting to see people basically looking into that. And interestingly enough, we have been seeing quite a lot of those banks, quite a lot of the banks that we're working with or having conversation with seriously looking into DeFi, right? Because um, now when you're basically thinking about what does it mean for FX, right? You have... 24-7 system uh, that settles immediately, right? Um, you, you know, you don't need to be, you don't have cutoffs, right? It's not like, you know, 5 p.m., that's it. You know, you cannot send the wire. You can basically execute hedge uh, on a foreign exchange and, you know, every given point you can do it over the weekends, right? So it has this amazing promise. The caveat there is really that, you know, we, if, if we talked earlier about uh, compliance and, you know, regulatory oversight, DeFi is probably in the most extreme area of the non-regulated right now, right? Those are completely permi per permissionless protocols, right? Anyone can access those protocols from anywhere in the world. And, and clearly there is a lot of questions that comes from an anti-money laundry over there, right? So there are multiple initiatives right now going on in the industry in terms of figuring out, I would say, that part and basically make it... Uh, you know, more kosher and basically bring it 
to the to the to the very regulated institutions that they will be able to use those protocols as well and basically push it into the into the you know into the mainstream. I want to bring Catherine in a moment because I'd like to hear about the sort of a very regulated or at least more conservative institution would feel about these opportunities. But just before I do, like, what is the profile of the 30% clients that you referred to? What kind of investors are we talking about who are really sort of using those services right now? Yeah, so so right now we're seeing mostly, I would say, um, you know, hedge funds, market makers, prop traders, but we're actually seeing asset managers sort of stepping in, right, Then and want to use, you know, there are two... Uh, very famous protocols over there, um, Ave and uh, and Compound, that are basically are able to generate yield on on stable coin, uh, or you know on on other assets. And but for I would say for the next uh, right now the, the people that are the, the, right now the people that are interacting with those protocols, um, they are able to wrap their head around the the, the compliance aspects. The next wave of investors that we, I think, we're going to see coming in is once we are able to solve the, the solve the the compliance issues that surround those protocols, and you know there are a few initiatives over there that are being, uh, you know, some of them already in beta, and some of them will launch by the by the end of the year. So just as an example, we have a a, a project going on with Ave, which is sort of like the, this multi-billion-dollar um, DeFi protocol, which creates a sanctioned sort of pool, right? You only interact with people, it, although it's it's running on DeFi, you only interact with people that pass the same KYC AML procedures uh, as you are. And we already have about 40, you know, 40 institutions that are participating in that beta. And you, you actually see over there banks, you see some of the biggest asset managers that are in that beta. Um, in, and 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 you, it's like a very different demography of people that are coming in to participate. Wow, that's yeah, it's, it's amazing how quickly it's moving. But Catherine, are you looking to take those policemen's money and 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 farm some yield in the DeFi world at this stage? Absolutely. And and so some of the companies that have been mentioned today um, up here are portfolio companies in the funds that we already have investments in, and so happily some of them have done uh, very very well already in the last few years. And so uh, I, I guess as an investor, and I'll, just, I'll pivot this a little bit, but when we started looking at the space, um, there's, there's a lot to look at, right? And, 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 and it depends on if you want to be completely liquid. So on the cryptocurrency side, it depends on if you're willing to be locked up. So venture capital, um, which, is, which is making obviously private investments in, in, in some of these companies. Um, and so that's just one thing to mention. Um, and our, as I mentioned earlier, our investments to date have all been in the venture capital uh, realm, but in each case also there is a certain portion that's liquid cryptocurrency. As I also mentioned, we're about to recommend a manager which is completely liquid cryptocurrency and it's long and short. And I mentioned that because they do do yield farming, they do do basis trading, they have part of their strategy that's market neutral. And it's not something, you know, when you think about like a classic hedge fund that might be market neutral, that they're typically taking out beta to equities, right? Well, in this case, they're market neutral, they're taking out beta to Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies themselves, right? So we think of that as a hedge fund strategy, like we would think of a market neutral, you know, equity market neutral manager or other type of a relative value strategy. Um, so it's really interesting. So in that case, it's not directional. Whereas, um, as I, I keep kind of going back and forth here, but whereas the cryptocurrency that I have in my venture capital funds is completely long only, right? So I have long only beta, if you will, to cryptocurrency over here, and then over here, I'm gonna hopefully, if it gets approved, um, have uh, you know a classic hedge fund. And I think that there really are um, some, you know, a lot of inefficiencies. I mean, this this part of you know this 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 realm, if you will, is still really new, right? So I think that there's still a decent amount of inefficiency, which hopefully means that there's a lot of interesting alpha opportunities for the crypto um, hedge funds, you know, to, to take advantage of. You know, Zach. Um, I it's it's useful thinking about this because you know uh, Michael was talking about you know twenty four seven markets you know real time settlement and so forth and I think it, the 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 not so well informed uh, folks who look at the, the the lending space the DeFi space as well look at these yields and say okay this has got to be some scam this is you know the the, the Fed funds rates at zero and how are you getting four or six seven eight um, you walk us through the math, right? Because some of it is, in fact, the efficiencies of this of this settlement process, right? And how how is it that is it, you know, or is it just opportunistic you know, lending? What's because you've also got this institutional 
marketplace that you're operating in on behalf of others. So maybe just explaining how all that comes together to enable the kind of yields that are available would be useful. Yeah, sure. So um, I think one of the things that can be confusing is that uh, it is quite different on the dollar or stablecoin side versus the cryptocurrency side. But in both cases, the fundamental reason why you see platforms like BlockFi offering you know, mid or high single digit uh, annual interest rates on these assets is that the cryptocurrency sector is not connected to traditional debt capital markets yet. You don't have large scale banks making loans to cryptocurrency companies, maybe with the exception of uh, Coinbase and, and MicroStrategy now who are in the public equity markets and able to uh, you know, raise uh, debt. Um, using their publicly traded equity. But, but other than that, you don't really have connectivity there. So as a result, you're left with uh, you know, private debt markets or uh, just higher cost of capital debt markets um, like BlockFi and other alternative lenders. And, and this happens in other sectors. I, I frequently reference a, uh, a publicly traded REIT called Innovative Industrial Properties. And they um, do triple net leases on uh, warehouses where folks grow cannabis. And you can't do bank financing for that. If they were growing carrots, it would have a three, four percent cost of capital, but they're growing cannabis, so it's you know fifteen percent. And so by participating in these lending programs, you're helping to finance this market that doesn't have access to traditional financing and therefore the cost of capital is higher. And what's I think particularly compelling if you're thinking about a risk adjusted return as a debt investor is that when you're lending in these markets, you uh typically have liquid collateral. So it's it's kind of like this super low risk form of lending where you can uh, manage the risk in the book, liquidate a position if needed. And in the three and a half years since BlockFi has been lending, we've never lost a penny across any of the lending that we do. Um, so despite it being in an asset class that's very volatile, uh, it's low risk and, and you're getting very well compensated for that. Um, and then on the cryptocurrency side, if you... Uh, you know, are a market making firm or a proprietary trading firm, and you're making a market or, or participating in any asset class, commodities, FX, uh, generally you want to have some inventory. Um, and in the cryptocurrency sector, the inventory that you need is Bitcoin and Ethereum. Uh, and furthermore, there are lots of compelling uh, arbitrage opportunities. It could be uh, the futures basis, which which blows out very frequently. It could be um, trust products that are you know, traded over the counter at, at big premiums or discounts to NAV. And for these types of trades, you want to be short uh, the underlying for one leg of that trade to execute it effectively. And so you need to borrow cryptocurrency for that. So the institutional uh, clients at BlockFi are generally borrowing cryptocurrency. Dollars are borrowed by institutions and retail investors participating in the space. Um, and I think the rates will stay high for, for quite a while. Yeah, I mean, it often reminds me of the of the repo market, this this activity, you know, which is uh, interesting seeing how these models emerge in a, in a digital world. Dan, you know, w you know, as somebody who, who's gone on this journey, what are you what what are you excited about now? I mean, uh, these new DeFi lending models. What what's what's the next big zeitgeist? Do you think? Yeah, I guess I would say that to bring it full circle is there is more than one asset now, and we you know a lot of my friends are Bitcoin maximalists, and you know. It's, it's got to be about Bitcoin. But the only thing I would share as advice to investors is there are so many different interesting protocols to invest in out there in so many different companies. And so a portfolio should be more than just one thing. And it, uh, the perspective I would have is Bitcoin's been amazing. Um, our fund's up 600x. So, you know, it's, it, Bitcoin's done great. But And I think it's going to go up another 10x or something from here. But I'm not sure that I actually think the majority of future gains are from things other than Bitcoin. And I know that sounds heretical to <laughs> some people in the audience, but it's kind of like in 1998, saying that majority of future tech gains were not in Microsoft. Microsoft did great. It was worth $260 billion then, but Amazon was worth 10 billion. Apple was worth one and Google and Facebook were zero. They weren't, they weren't even existing yet. And since then, uh, Microsoft's only been 20% of the gains since 1998 in tech. All these other companies that didn't even exist in 1998. And that's the spirit I have here is that I think Bitcoin's going to go up a ton. It's a huge, great investment. If that's all you can get through your IC, you know, you should be long Bitcoin. But like if you can be long a basket of things, I think it's going to outperform. Did they let you speak at Bitcoin Miami? 
That would have been heretic, you know, <laughs> heresy. Uh, how about you, Nathan? What do you see, you know, from, from your sort of... I think just to, just to kind of piggyback off what Dan is saying, this is one of the things that is is clear in the conversations we're having with many of the, the global financial institutions, uh, say banks or, uh, or others. Uh, they're really kind of looking at the next 10, 20 years and understanding this is an asset class. Uh, and this is, is truly a, a comprehensive asset class that they may be thinking about strategically. Uh, and so anybody kind of developing a strategy in this, whether you're a bank or an investment uh, investment advisor um, or even even a pension, is to look at what are the what is the sum total of the the opportunities here. Uh, the way the way that I think about Bitcoin is Bitcoin was in many ways it was a, a gift to the world and that uh, Bitcoin functionally acts as a, a global public utility. It is it is owned by no one. Everybody uh, gets to participate in it, and the the most optimistic version of what's what's coming within with, within crypto uh, is that we can have dozens, if not hundreds, of global public utilities uh, that are available and, and co-owned as you know really infrastructure for the world. And so Bitcoin kind of blazed that trail for us, uh, but there's a, a huge huge amount of these that are going to come out over the next uh, several decades. Uh, going to be really exciting and going to be really kind of uh, leveling of the playing field uh, for a lot of uh, financial inclusion. Of all the crypto gains have been things other than Bitcoin. Since mid-February, Bitcoin has kind of drifted down and uh, other tokens have created hundreds of billions of value. So the market cap itself has grown, but you know, Bitcoin has not yeah, been the driver. During that yeah. time, it's been non-Bitcoin mm. tokens that have done more than 100% of the game. Yeah, we, I mean, there's a lot of focus on the flipping with the ETH, ETH and, and that may be just missing the point, really. It's actually sort of this this bigger universe. Um, you know, so this is the, the vision, uh, Catherine, you heard it from Nathan, this sort of this emerging asset class, this idea of uh, all of these sort of opportunities that are, exist in what I think you described as an, almost like a, a technology play, a bet on the internet, almost a new internet. Um, but what needs to happen so that, you know, a lot of these other funds can follow, you know, the Fairfax County policeman uh, into this space. There's still we've we've talked about custody, but there's there's other elements of the infrastructure that need to be in place, right? Um, I obviously we were comfortable doing this three years ago, and and I and I wouldn't say that it was, I wouldn't say that that it was perfect. I guess I wouldn't say that many investments are, are probably perfect, but. Um, you know, as I said earlier, uh, there, you know, the, the the service providers weren't kind of as institutional in nature, if you will, three years ago, and and, and that's changing. Um, but I think that in general, you know, I, I made that comment that, you know, if we see a manager that self custodies, you know, if, if if this were five years ago and now we're looking at a different strategy, and I would think oh, I would never hire a manager, right? Who would do that, right? But but indeed we did, and I understand the reasons why. You know, when some of these tokens initially get released and, and you can't find a custodian that, that is able to custody them for a certain period. So I understand the rationale for why people do self-custody. In the case of one of the managers I mentioned, they self-custody and then they um, and the, but then they do also use an external custodian. But then they actually own that custodian as well. And so there's just, you know, there can be a lot, a lot of kind of entangling potential conflicts of interest that if you were looking at any other sector. And I spent a lot of time looking at alternatives and hedge funds prior to my current role. And, you know, there, there are a lot of reasons to say no. There are plenty of reasons to say no, to be perfectly frank as an institutional investor. Plenty of reasons to say no. But I, you know, I, I wouldn't say that you should just suspend your judgment, but I would say that you need to look with an open mind and realize that this is, it's an emerging, you know, area. And that means that all of the service providers and everything around it is also still emerging and for all of us to be a little bit open-minded. But I think it'll get there. And I think, um, you know, we we happen to be somewhat of the mindset that we do think eventually that 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 most assets are probably going to be digitized, right? And so, um, if you think that, um, then then you ought to be an adopter of, of, of everything that we're talking about. So, um, I think people will get there. I mean, I, I will say the following: I think that that um, crypto is extremely volatile, right? So, I think you need to go into it expecting that and size it appropriately and have an appetite or or at least a willingness to accept a lot of volatility. And I do also think that, and I think this comment was made this morning on a panel, but I think that, um, you know, if every institution were today or tomorrow going to go out and populate 1% of their portfolio with Bitcoin, I think you'd have some tremendous issues with liquidity as well. So, I mean, I think that, you know, it's still growing, but I, I think that, I think it will, I think we'll get there. 
but careful what you wish for in a way. You don't want them all coming in at once. Yeah. Um, but, but just to drill down a little bit more, it seems to me, you know, there's been quite a bit of discussion about these service providers and prime brokerages, for example, there. Um, you know, you, you went into this without the kind of hand-holding of a prime brokerage. Um, it, how, how valuable will it be for, you know, maybe funds that don't have the capacity to sort of take this more radical view that you did to have something like that kind of, you know, more focused service, you know? Um, yeah, absolutely. I think, um, I think that would be... I think that would be great. Yeah. <laughs> so that would be really helpful. I mean, you know, for us, we um, it just even honestly, just even trying to get like a, a sense of how large the the universe is of managers. You know, you have people like Pantera that are very well known and they've been doing this for a long time. And there's, you know, the, a group of managers who I would put in that camp. But you have a lot of people who've been doing this two years or less. And I mean, I don't know how many crypto funds there are, but, you know, there are a lot, right? So even just honestly trying to get your hands around, okay, how large is the universe? Who's doing this? Are they doing crypto? Are they doing venture? Are they doing tokens? You know, even just trying to get your arms around that. When we forget understanding that the actual technology part of this, it's a lot to take on, right? And so depending on the size of your team, and we have a very small team, I mean, it's it's a lot to get your arms around. So, you know, and I think as a result of that, I think, you know, the consultant community is probably, you know, kind of coming up to speed now. And and But I, I think I think things will get there. Michael, what have you seen in terms of that kind of educational element to it, right? I mean, these clients who come to you and you've got to walk through them through this new this new field, uh, explaining something like, you know, MPC for one is difficult, but then all these other elements as well. I mean, I think that I, I spent probably 50% of my time on education, right? I think that, uh, you know, it takes time to, um, to familiarize people with the concepts, right, of uh, this uh, brave new world, right? And uh, I think that, you know, to you know, to Catherine's point, I think a lot of a lot of the concepts in this space are actually contradictory to <laughs> the way that finance was working for I don't know, the last five hundred five hundred years or one hundred years, right? Uh, and you know, and, and in many aspects, really, blockchain is is a revolution that probably is the most impactful revolution since you know the Federal Reserve was set up, right? In terms of how clearing and settlement is 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 working, and uh, and this technology. Uh, yeah, I remember that we spent about maybe like three hours on a workshop with the all the um, sort of CIO, C, the chief uh, information officers and the CISOs in one of the big ba banks. And like after two hours, they basically we need we need a break. You know, our, our <laughs> mind is just exploded yeah. from you know from everything that uh, you guys were explaining. So. We spend a lot of time on education. I think that there are many layers, and I think that uh, clearly different people want to to understand different things. But um, it's also very clear that this is going to replatform finance. I mean, the the aspect around the the fact that uh, the talk the assets are going to be tokenized. Um, I think you know, if two years ago people were not sure, so sure about it. I think that now it's sort of a common uh, thesis among uh, pretty much all the the practitioner, and um, and I think that you know understanding exactly how it works is sort mm. of important, right? Because it does fundamentally changes uh, the way that th things work. I mean, just like a, a an interesting example, I was sitting with. Uh, you know, was was one of the partners of a hedge fund that was uh, affected in the GameStop um, uh, saga, and and when I explained them, like you know how blockchain works and especially how the clearing works, they like suddenly like there was a silence, and they say, hey, you know, if if this was actually tokenized, right, and there wasn't like you know this three days gap between the point that the trade was booked and until it was actually cleared, we wouldn't be like you know short squeeze, right? Mm -hmm. That that. And, and that's just like you know something that is sort of a very technical aspect, but it's important to the level of the the, the, the you know the, the the partners and the people that really take the decisions. Yes, yeah, so it's like, you know, where I come from, uh, the penny drop moment, the sort of sudden realization that 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 it all comes together. And I think that's one of the experiences that a lot of us have had in this space. I did want you to have one quick last word, Zach. Just I've got half a minute, so it's going to take it's not going to have much time, unfortunately. But just you service both retail institutions. We have a lot of focus on the institutions here, but it seems like the trailblazers in terms of investors in this space have always been retail. Is that going to continue? 
yeah, I, I think absolutely. And I, I really wanted to answer the question of what am I excited about? Because I did something the other day that like wowed me. It, it reminded me of the first time I transferred money off of Coinbase to buy Ethereum back in like 2016. And that was really scary for like a year because Ethereum crashed like 60%. But I remember being wowed. And, and that happened to me recently uh, with uh, Solana, who, who I know is here, and, and Phantom Wallet. So I would encourage everyone to, um, you know, if you can find five minutes, 10 minutes, uh, interact with some of the actual, um, you know, tools out there in the ecosystem. Try MetaMask, uh, try Phantom Wallet um, on Solana. There's some really, really cool stuff. And when you see it in action, you really have this kind of aha moment. And I think that can be, you know, eye opening and, and motivating to take it into whatever your, uh, you know, professional day job is and help uh, <laughs> help create some uh, so, some advocates within the firm. So there you go, folks. You have your CTA, uh, some homework to do. Get out there, uh, play around with it. It's it's definitely the best way to learn. Uh, a round of applause for this tremendous panel. Thanks very much.